Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. So my understanding is I've got about 45 minutes, and then we'll do questions. Yeah? All right. Um, so before I, I get going, I want to just do a little bit of like a, a child age check. So if you've got kids uh, that are 0 to 5, can you throw your hands up? You can look around the room just to see who's all in the room. If you've got kids uh, that are between 5 and 8, Good. How about 9 and 12? Okay, lots. Okay. <laughs> it's funny how it starts to really come up then, doesn't it? Um, and then uh, 12 to uh, 16, 17. Okay, lots there too. Okay, great. All right, that's super helpful. There, I'm going to try and cover a lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, and partly what that means is there'll be stuff that isn't terribly relevant for uh, your child, right? If I'm talking about preschoolers and your kids in high school, probably doesn't apply. Um, and if I'm talking about um, uh, porn or social media, then it's probably not that relevant for you yet if you've got a, a kid in grade one or two, right? But you can just file it away, um, either for when you're a grandparent um, or uh, for when your children are a little bit older. Um, so uh, you have some handouts there. Um, at the PowerPoint presentation, I'm going to we'll kind of walk through uh, some of those slides and give some additional information and context. Um, and then I'll sometimes refer to uh, this one, to the basic guideposts uh, handout. But they're all uh, for you to look at and to think about. And you can certainly ask questions on any of the content if I don't address it in the next 43 minutes. So uh, as a basic agenda, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, sex versus sexuality. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the value of raising sex smart kids. Um, and I think particularly relevant now in 2014, um, given the lives we live and the world around us. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how, pa as parents and as educators, we can manage our own discomfort on the topic. Um, and I want to give uh, uh, some, uh, some basics around uh, sexual development and milestones for young people. Um, because that, I think, helps to contextualize when um, they are developmentally ready for certain kinds of information. Um, that, so that, that kind of covers it. So um, one of the things that I talked about the high schoolers today, one of the things I asked them is where do, where do young people learn about sex? And, uh, and the truth is they learn about sex from a whole lot of places. Generally speaking, uh, when there are statistics that are gathered uh, from high schoolers, um, they tend to find that predominantly young people will say that they learned about sex from their school, their friends, and their parents. Right? And then they list a bunch of other places where they've learned about sex and sexuality. So I think that that's kind of good news. Those are places where they ought to be learning about sex and sexuality. I think the part that isn't captured in the research anywhere in a terribly comprehensive way is how much they are learning from those sources. And my sense is they're not learning enough. Right? So that they might learn some of the basics from those places. Um, and then they fill in a lot of blanks from those other sources. Um, and I'd like to see that increase. I'd like to see the parents and the schools offering more, more holistic, more comprehensive information um, so that our young people aren't going to the places like TV and internet, uh, magazines. I mean, certainly some of the places offer sound information. And one of the things that I'll be able to provide to you are some websites and books that I think are really excellent for uh, providing comprehensive information. So I, um, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about uh, the difference, in, in my mind anyways, we, we can all have our own definitions uh, between sex and sexuality. Because I think what happens is that parents often get really nervous about telling their kids about 
sex, about the act, sexual intercourse. Um, I, I, I often will get a group of parents laughing when I say the hardest thing you'll ever have to say to your kid is a penis goes into a vagina to deliver sperm. And they're like, I don't want to say that <laughs> to my children. So it's a little unnerving to say that. But that isn't the first message that we can offer our young people uh, when it comes to sexuality. Because sexuality is this incredibly large and diverse topic. It's uh, something that is so broad. Um, and it, the, the, this page here that has like the flower, um, I, I actually drew this for a number of the high school kids. And I, I love it. And, um, and the reason why I love it is because at the center of sexuality is power and agency. And I think these are the lessons that we're looking to communicate to our kids all the time from the moment they come out of us. The moment they join the world, we are looking to give them information about how they have personal power, they have agency over their, themselves, that they, they, they have choices and that they can exercise good choices. Um, and we, we offer them advice and lessons around power and agency the whole time, right? Right through their development every stage, there's opportunities to talk about self-control, self-management, about um, exploring uh, their environment, about um, seeing the options that are in front of them. And I think all of those are relevant where sex and sexuality is concerned. So I often make that the, the central force of any conversation or communication that I have with young people around sex and sexuality. And then there are all these other areas, and all of them are important. It's not just about teaching our kids about what sexual intercourse is. So there's, uh, there's sensuality, a little bit of a complex concept for a young person. Um, uh, but nonetheless, when kids are 8 or 9 or 10, there are ways for us to start talking about how people hold themselves in the world. Um, I think intimacy is something that we um, hopefully are modeling to young people. Um, so whether we're showing affection for our spouse or for our children, um, those are ways that we uh, express intimacy. And we can talk about what makes uh, a relationship to a spouse or a significant other different than the way we express intimacy to our children or to our parents or to our friends. Um, and those are good things for us to distinguish and help them see the difference between. Um, there's also uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And those are two very different concepts. But um, even today, I was uh, talking uh, to the high school students about uh, those things and how much they've, those, those issues in particular have changed in just one generation. Um, and I think to the benefit of young people today um, that uh, ideas of sexual orientation and gender identity are really challenging our understanding of uh, who people are in the world and how they get to show up and the choices they get to make. Um, and I actually think this is something that is way more of a struggle for us than it is for our, our children. Um, they're able to um, accept differences uh, a, a lot more easily than I think some of us are. Um, and, um, and I think that that will serve them well. I think it helps break down ideas of uh, what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, how we have to uh, or don't have to express uh, those sorts of ideas. Um, I talked a little bit about um, uh, how, how ideas of gender really are a bit of a social experiment, you know? Kids are born and we look at their biological sex, we literally look what's between their legs and we decide whether they can wear a dress or can't wear a dress, right? Um, and, uh, and so having things that challenge that and, and let us say like, well, my little boy can wear pink. Pink is cool. Um, it, there's nothing, pink isn't, cis it's like, it's all a part of the, uh, the, the culture that we've been raised in that gives us these, these rules that, uh, that really could be uh, broken, those rules. Um, and I think, I think our young people are getting that when we, when we offer them the opportunity to express themselves in the ways that they choose. Um, they might choose lots of things, uh, a whole range, a diverse range of things. Um, the other one that's on here is sexual and reproductive health. I think this is really important. One of the things that I said to a couple of the classrooms today is I explained that testicular cancer is a, a cancer uh, of young men. Um, most diagnoses happen between 25 and 35. Um, 
And, and really what that means is that young men need to understand how to take care of their bodies. And unless we nurture um, and teach them how to look after their bodies, how to notice their bodies, um, how to um, investigate their genitals and then bring forward concerns that they have, we're going to have young men who either don't pay attention or notice something but don't know how to broach it with anybody. So there's some really practical health implications to, um, to young people not having information about their bodies. And in part, um, I think that those are lessons that can start really young, just like we want to let our kids know to pay attention to their bodies um, and to help them identify what they're feeling. You know, my, this is kind of unrelated, but my, we, we had a nasty bout of the stomach flu just last week. I was glad it wasn't this week. And um, both my, my kids were up vomiting. And my, my youngest son is seven. And a day and a half later, he was still home. Um, and he had stopped uh, vomiting, thank God. And, um, and, and, he, and we were talking about dinner. And he wanted to have his favorite dinner. And he's a full-on carnivore. And he just, he was like, steak. We had, he had this plan to have steak. And he's like, well, maybe I shouldn't have steak. And I said, well, well why? And he said, well, my stomach has been upset. I said, that's true. But how do you feel? Like, does your body want steak? Because when you're healthy, you often will be, you'll say, I want, that's what I want. And he said, well, yeah, my, it does, but maybe, like, I'm, you know, he wanted my insights. And I just pushed it back on him. And I said, you know, if your body is saying, gee, I'm really not sure, then I think you should listen to your body. But if your body is saying, like, oh, man, I really want that piece of meat, then I think you should listen to your body. I want... I want my kids to trust their bodies, right? And the same is true for their, for their reproductive health um, and their genitals. I want them to be able to trust their bodies and, and, and pay attention to the messages that they're, that they're being offered. So I want, my, uh, I want young kids to know what their body parts are called so that if they have a pain, they, they are able, really young kids can say if, some, if they're feeling something on the inside or the outside. So if they go, ouch, it hurts, right? If you've given them language to say, oh, is it your penis or does it feel like it's on the inside, like your urethra, right? If you've offered an explanation of the differences, right? There's a tube inside your penis. There's a tube that um, comes out at your, in your vulva and it goes to your bladder and it's where the urine or pee comes out. Our kids are like, oh, there's a tube that carries the urine, right? Oh, there's a tube for the pee. They get that. And then they're able to sort of say, no, it's, no, it's the skin, or no, it feels like it's the tube, right? They can say, no, it feels like my urethra. So we can help our kids when they've got bladder infections to name them, right? And that can start really young. I was saying to the faculty this afternoon that some people say, well, oh, I don't want to, you know, I'd say that the baby grows in the tummy because uh, uterus is such a big word. And my response is four-year-olds can say Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> and if they can say Tyrannosaurus, they can say uterus. So all we need to do is offer them the words for their bodies. And just because it's on the inside doesn't mean they can't start to understand it, right? Mm -hmm. So we can tell them about their lungs and how their lungs inflate uh, with oxygen and send that oxygen around their bodies to give them power. And in the same vein, we can teach them that babies grow in a uterus. And we can explain that a uterus is like a sack, a really strong bag, right, that is stretchy and grows as the baby grows. That's super relatable and understandable. So uh, there's all sorts of reproductive health that we can offer very young children. And as they get older, we can offer them more and more information. You know, when I think about when's the right time to start talking to young people, I think it's the moment they're born. It's the way we talk to them about their own bodies, right? There's not a moment. Um, that it's, it's like, it, it, it would be like saying, you know, there's a time when it's not appropriate to teach a kid math if they're interested. If they see one thing over there and one thing over there and you say, how many do you have all together, right? Your kid could be 18 months old and that's a fine lesson to help them think through concepts. And the same is true with uh, bodies. The same is true with sex and sexuality. What we know is that people are sexual their entire lives. Um, I was explaining to some of the classrooms today that um, uh, male-bodied people have erections in utero. 
and they have erections from the moment they're born, right? Boy bodies have erections. And hopefully they have erections their entire life. And that's a good message for us to be offering young people. And I think a really important message to be offering our young children, which is to name it. When my kids were a couple years old, bath time or just running around naked time, if I saw that one of them had an erection, I would say, oh, look, your penis is hard. That's called an erection. And they'd look down, and they'd grab it, and then they'd let go, and off they'd go, right? That was it. Mm -hmm. Or I would say, oh, your penis, you have an erection. It'll go away in a minute, right? I wanted my kids to make a connection between what was happening to them physiologically and the feeling that they have. My understanding, I have heard, that it feels different to have an erection. So I want it, some people in the room probably can confirm that for me. But I, I want my kids to pay attention to their bodies, right? It's like, I feel like one of the things parents realize is that they need to help their kids understand when they're hungry, right? Because they get all hangry and rangy if they're, right? We all, lo low blood sugar, we kind of freak out. So I feel like one of the things I have been developing especially with my older kid, is to identify when he is breaking down because of hunger, right? Because he had, it's like he didn't have a sense of it. He didn't know how to identify it. And so that really is the same skill as helping our children understand their bodies and what their bodies feel like um, at different times. <clears throat> so all this to say, um, oh, I didn't even touch on the last one, sexual behaviors and practices. This is the one that I think we often spend a lot of time thinking about uh, when it comes to trying to educate uh, and provide some context and understanding to our young people. Um, and um, I think it comes from a good place, uh, our concern or our worry. Um, there is a, a, a predominant myth that if we equip young people with information, they're going to run out and do it, right? If we tell them how sex happens, they're going to run out and go and have sex. I want to offer really clear uh, information that that is false, that any research that has been conducted shows the opposite, that young people who are equipped with comprehensive sex education are more likely to delay their sexual debut, which is sort of new language for virginity. It's better language because really somebody who gives a lot of blowjobs is still sexually active, even if they haven't had penetrative sex. Yes? So people who have information when they're young tend to hold off on becoming sexually active. I think it's because when we don't have information and we want to know something about it, we find that information one way or another. And sometimes experiential education is what's available to us. I think when we have open and honest conversations with young people, when we offer them good information, they're more likely to say, gee, I'm reading a lot about this and it seems kind of intense or it seems heavy or I'd like to kind of feel more um, self-assured. I'd like to feel more comfortable with my own body before I do X, Y, or Z with somebody else. So I... I really want to let people know that uh, talking to young people isn't going to cause them to go running out. In fact, you know, the highest rates of unintended pregnancy are in the states, in, in, in the developed world, are in the states where abstinence-only education is the predominant sex education model, right? So those kids who have access to very, very little education are are overwhelmingly the ones who are 15, 16, 17, 18 years old with sexually transmitted infections and with unintended pregnancies. I think that's telling, personally. Um, so all this to say that sexuality is a very broad and I think complex area. Um, and for me, that's a reason to start offering more simple uh, lessons and explanations to our young kids. Um, I, I, I'm a strong believer in front-loading our kids, right? I think when they're young, they're very open uh, to any information that we have to offer. Um, I think as they get older, it's, develop it, it's not just what I think, it is developmentally appropriate for kids to start putting their parents at arm's length a little, right? When they hit 13, 14, 15, they're doing a lot of like, 
I'm going to learn from other places now. Back off, right? I'll talk to you on my terms when I feel like it. Some of that starts to happen. And if we ha uh, have offered our kids uh, ourselves as resources around sex and sexuality, if we've um, answered their questions, if we've offered information about how bodies function, um, about uh, ways to express uh, sex and sexuality in the world, if we help them interpret messages that they see on billboards and in magazines um, and on the TV or commercial radio stations, if we help them tease out some of the messaging that's there, then number one, they're going to be more equipped to, uh, to take in the more complex messages that come to them. And when they're ready to start picking up messages from their peers and from a larger environment where they feel confused um, or where there are mixed messages, they may feel all the more, com more comfortable to come to you and say, hold on, I don't get it, or explain this to me, or this is throwing me for a loop, right? Um, so I, I think there's a great opportunity for us to set our kids up uh, and letting them know that, we, that where sex is concerned, we are their ally, right? We don't have to be their friend. Uh, I know some parents really work hard to be friends with their kids. I do not need to be, and people can have their own perspective on this, I do not need to be friends with my children. I need to be my children's parent. And I want them to know that I have their back, that when they're in trouble, I ought to be, I can be the very first person they reach out to, right? I want them to know that in absolute terms. I want them to know that. And that's the case where sex and sexuality is concerned too. So that means needing to be approachable when they're 14 or 15 or 16 or sometimes 13 or 25, right? We want our kids to be able to come to us and say, I made a mistake, or I have an infection. Something's going on down there, and it's freaking me out, right? Um, we need to make sure our kids um, can approach us um, and get the support and the help that they need. So um, sex positivity, I, I think this is great. Sex positivity is the view that the only relevant measure of a sexual act, practice, or experience is the consent, pleasure, and well-being of the people engaged in it or the people affected by it. So this is actually a really fundamental idea for me personally. I feel like we live at, at, in, at a time um, our culture is um, inundated. We are, we are constantly being bombarded with sexual messages, right? It's, it's inescapable. And I know there are lots of parents that try and keep their kids from that. And, and many parents probably achieve that to some degree. And I think it's impossible to live in North America and keep our kids from all of the messages. And because so many of the messages, in my mind, are not terribly positive, I think it is particularly critical as parents to offer the positive messages. Because if we don't, who's going to? So the positive messages for me are that sex, sex is a wonderful, enriching thing as part of the human experience. I want my kids to know that. It's fundamental to me. I think it teaches people a great deal. It is an incredible way to experience intimacy with another person. It's a way to understand yourself. It helps you go to sleep at night. It helps you wake up in the morning. It does all sorts of things that are good. And I want my kids to know that. In fact, I want them to know that before they hear the messages that sex is dirty and depraved and hedonistic. I want fundamentally the lesson that they have to be that sex is something that can enrich them in their lives, it's something that can enrich the, you know, the person that they may feel closest to. And I think that if we don't tell them that, I'm not sure where they're going to learn it. I mean, I hope they learn it anyways. But I want to be the person who offers that kind of lesson to my kid. You know, um, about two years ago, 
I was in the car with my son, and um, I often have the radio on and the news. And um, and a story. The, it was the um, the conviction uh, in Steubenville, Ohio, of the two teenage boys who had been drunk at a party and sexually assaulted one of their classmates or a girl their age, and they were convicted of sexual assault. And the story came on, and I tried to turn it off really quickly. And um, and my son said, well, what was that about? Because he's paying it, he pays attention. And I had, a, I had a choice to make. I could either deflect, right? That would have been easy enough. I do it all the time. So just so you know, just because there's a sexual message that pops up doesn't mean I address it every single time. Because we all create some white noise around sex and sexuality. It's so pervasive, right? So sometimes I deflect. But sometimes I take a big breath. <laughs> And I start to talk, even if the timing isn't what I intended it to be. And my son asked, and, I, and we were alone in the car. His little brother was not there. And I thought, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach my kid about sexual assault. And uh, oh, it's hard for me to even talk about it, because it was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had with my kid. And I kind of think it should be, <laughs> because it's a really heavy topic. And it, it talks about a part of the world that is about ugliness. It's actually not at all about what is enriching and wonderful about sex and sexuality, but it is a reality. And I, so here's what was so interesting, is that I started to tell him, I said, and this, this girl was assaulted in a sexual way, and, and he said, oh, so they murdered her, right? And I, I stopped and I said, no, no, they didn't murder her, she didn't die, and this happened and this happened. And then later, I was thinking about it, and I thought, my eight-year-old knows what murder is. I never, ever told my kid what murder is. I mean, he knows that people die. But murder? That's a, that's a big idea, right? That is a big idea. And I had never had a conversation with my kid about it. And guess what? He learned it anyways. And I have no idea where he picked up that information. But where sexual assault was concerned, I was the person who offered the message. And what I told him was, wow, this is really hard to talk about because this is a part of human behavior that is really ugly, really nasty. And in fact, it doesn't really have anything to do with sex because sex is about consensual. Sex, sex positivity is about activity that is consensual and pleasurable and mutual. And this is anything but that. This is about violence. and. Um, and then we had a conversation about bystanders, because of course that story in, in part was about all these other kids that were around taking videos and posting them places and letting this assault happen. So it was a start for me to have a conversation about bullying, right? About seeing behavior in the playground or in school and how to interpret messages that other people are giving and how we can stand up for people, right? and how we can be good to other people. To make sure we're being good means you have to check in sometimes. So it was um, a really hard conversation. But at the end of it, it I, I literally, I was in knots for days. And, and still at the end of it, what I felt was uh, incredible gratitude that it was me who offered this information to my child. And it really made me um, glad that I had already started to have conversations with my kid about how sex is a good thing in the world. Because I wouldn't want his first messages about sexual activity to be about violent sexual activity, right? I want him to know that, um, that intimacy, sexual intimacy, is gorgeous. It's a beautiful thing, right? And he knows that. Now, today, if I ask my kid, why do people have sex? He'll usually say to have babies or have fun. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, right? It's like, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. That's exactly why people do it, right? I mean, there are a lot of reasons why people um, engage in sex. But uh, you know, fundamentally, those capture uh, most of it, right? I mean, w one of the things that I think can happen when we um, focus in on uh, telling our kids that sex uh, is for the purposes of procreation, is we can actually leave out every message about sex being for pleasure, right? Which is really such a shame. Like, 
pleasure. Why wouldn't we want to share that with our kids? What stops us? What prevents us from sharing a message of pleasure with our kids? What prevents parents from letting their daughters know that they have a part on their body called a clitoris that exists for no reason other than pleasure? Is it because they might find it? <laughs> Is that a bad thing? Why would it be bad for our kids to discover a part of their bodies that gives them pleasure? You know, a lot of young uh, kids uh, discover masturbation. If I did a survey in this room, probably a third of you would say, I've found my kid, you know, touching their genitals for what appeared to be pleasure. It's super, super common. Um, young people often will do it. Um, it, it's a self, it can be a, a self-soothing uh, technique, right? Um, it's also a self-soothing technique for adults, by the way. Um, but, um, you know, we, we might discover our children uh, masturbating. And, um, and I think a lot of parents um, are getting better at not shaming their kids for it, right? I mean, if our kids are touching their genitals, it's, there's usually a reason. It's not just like, you know, it's comfortable. It's like it's itchy or it's, you know, it feels weird or, you know, I have an erection and it's, you know, pushing against my pants are too tight or, you know, whatever it is. Or it's because it feels good, right? I mean, I always find that as soon as diapers come off, kids got their hands down their pants. And it's like, oh yeah, it's like the equivalent to the chastity belt, right? You've had like this prevented, you know, access to your own body part, you know? Um, and suddenly you've got some freedom and you're checking it out, which is great, it's wonderful. Um, and we can let our kids know that. So there's one thing to say like, well, I'm not gonna shame my child for touching their genitals. And that's great and important. But it's another step, a sex positive step, to acknowledge what your child is doing and let them know that you think it's healthy and good, right? Now, you can also set some boundaries to behavior, right? So grown-ups are really good at throwing out, that's, un that's inappropriate, <laughs> that's, which is just a catchphrase for stop, right? Stop talking, stop doing, right? That's inappropriate. But we rarely explain why something is inappropriate. And we might um, offer a message that captures far more than what we intend, right? We might be meaning to say, um, please don't do that in the company of others, right? We might not be trying to message, don't touch yourself. When we say that's, that's not appropriate though, how do we know how it's being understood, right? So we can offer, um, we can offer suggestions to our kids. We can even offer rules for where it's okay to do things and where it's not okay to do things. And this not only um, helps to set boundaries of uh, good behavior for our children, but it also keeps them safe, right? Because they shouldn't be walking around with their hands down their pants. They ought not to be touching their genitals when they're hanging out at their friends' houses. Um, those sorts of things can be misconstrued, even with young kids. So we wanna be able to offer our kids some boundaries right, about where it's appropriate to do certain things. I remember having a conversation with a neighbor of mine, fabulous woman who's got two daughters, and um, she had just read a blog post around masturbation. And one of the things that I had said was, you know, that you, we can let our kids know that after they touch their genitals, um, they can wash their hands. And she said, oh, that's, that's really interesting because I tell my kids to wash their hands before they touch their genitals. <laughs> And she's like, as somebody who has struggled my entire adult life with yeast infections, I want my kids to be able to touch themselves without giving them, like, without compromising the pH of their vulva. And I was like, that's so smart. <laughs> of course. Uh, people should wash their hands before they touch their genitals. This is really good messaging, right? Like, like this is an important part of your body. This is a part of your body that you ought to take care of. I mean, it's sort of like, the, it's similar to the mouth. I mean, I was telling the high school students this, right? Mucous membrane, it's inside our anus, it's inside our, uh, our vulvas, it's inside our mouths. It's very sensitive tissue, right? Um, Bacterias and viruses are opportunistic and they look for warm and moist parts of our bodies, which is why we get infections in this area and in this area, right? So trying to keep bacterias and viruses away from them is really, really smart. And our kids don't know that unless we tell them. Oh, time is ticking, my goodness. All right, 
empowered parents equals empowered kids. We have an incredible opportunity to communicate with our kids. Even if we weren't communicated with um, by our own parents or the schools we went to, if there was zero messaging about sex and sexuality, we can still do better by our kids. I've had some parents say, like, well, I figured it out. <laughs> I'm like, well, great, good for you, good for you. <laughs> but we don't need to stumble quite as much. And I've said, I said to the kids in high school, I said, you know, there, is, there, are, there are things that only you can discover for yourself. It doesn't matter how many books you read. It doesn't matter how many honest conversations you have. Uh, part of sex and sexuality is about exploration. It's about self-discovery, right? Nobody can tell you what you desire. That's something you have to figure out on your own. But we can offer opportunities to, to share with young people just how diverse and broad the opportunities are, just how much they have to discover. We can let them know that it's not something they're going to have figured out in a year or two. In fact, they might not have it figured out in a decade or two, right? This really is a lifelong pursuit, right? And they can enjoy it along the way. And they, and they can make um, smart decisions. They can feel like they're making the best decisions they're able to make in any given moment. Right? We can empower them with that. We can help them see that they have the power and the agency to make good decisions at any time. Um, overwhelmingly, I feel like um, parents think their kids are ready for messages about two to four years later than the kids themselves would say they're ready for certain messages. And this is pretty typical. Um, of the limited information we have about pornography, we know that the average age of boys, we don't have the same amount of stats for young girls, the, the average age for boys to first see porn is 11. Sometimes this is by intention, right? Google search, S-E-X, right? Other times it's like, you know, um, project on the solar system your anus, <laughs> right? Um, we could be do. oh, this is a good one. Um, you could do like a um, uh, research project on uh, woodland creatures, uh, beaver, <laughs> right? So those, all those slang words there, they really get you on the internet. So um, I like to say that, um, you were about two clicks, on YouTube, you were about two clicks away from porn, right? You can be looking at a cute kitty video, um, a funny cat video, and in a couple of clicks, right? Um, we don't have to be delinquent parents um, to realize that our kids can get there very, very quickly, okay? Um, so all this to say that um, the access is uh, very prevalent. It's very easy to get to. Um, and to me, that's a reason to offer good information to our kids in advance. About um, eight months ago, I decided, oh, no, I guess it was longer. About a year ago, I decided that I needed to have a conversation with my eldest about porn. Because he's, now he's 10, he's 10 and a half. And if the average age is 11, it means some kids stumble upon it or a friend shows them when they're 9 or 10 or sometimes they're 12, 13 or 14, but you better believe, you know, they've seen it by then. So I wanted to have a conversation with him and I was gripped. So I was doing sex ed with parents and I was practicing what I was going to say. They're like, oh, you're so good at that. I'm like, I know this is like my 12th iteration and it's getting, I'm getting closer to having the conversation. Anyways, we had the conversation, and of course, I was thinking I needed to set it up, and I needed, and lo and behold, one morning, he climbs into bed with me, and his brother isn't around, and, um, and we just have a couple of quiet minutes, right? And I don't know what came up um, about computers, um, but it often comes up. And, um, and, and I said, hey, do you, do you know what porn is? Have you ever heard of the word porn or pornography? And he's like, nope. I said, OK. And, uh, and then I had, I think it was four things that I wanted to communicate with him. And it took about two minutes, tops. Kind of felt a lot longer. But, um, and the, the thing uh, that I explained was porn or pornography are um, 
are usually images or video of people who are naked or people who are engaged in sexual activity. That's what porn is. And then I said, there's a lot of it on the internet. And then I said, it's really easy to find, actually. And then I said, it wasn't made for kids. And that's really important for you to know. Porn is made for adults. And it's made to make adults feel sexy. And that's OK, because that's an adult thing to feel. And it's a nice thing for adults to feel. But porn is made for adults to feel that way. And it is not made to educate kids or to make kids feel sexy. And then I said, if you ever see porn, or if somebody wants to show you porn, I want you not to look at it, please. And I'd like for you to let me know. OK? And he said, OK. <laughs> and that was it. And then I like, kind of was like in a bit of a jello-y kind of place for a little bit. And then I thought, OK, that wasn't so bad, you know? And that, those were the important, that's, that was like the high level information that I wanted. I want my kid to hear it from me before he stumbles on it, right? I want to give him some context because you could discover things that kind of mess with your head. They offer a really skewed idea of sex and sexuality. So now, might my kid go looking for it now? Maybe, but I don't think so, actually. I think what I've done was offer him a suggestion about why it's not a great idea for him to access it. And the truth is, if he was curious before, he'll remain curious, right? Or he might remain curious. And if he wasn't curious before, He'll probably wait until he has curiosity if he is, in fact, going to search it out. But I do know that if he stumbles across it, he's going to know what it is. He's going to realize that it isn't supposed to be for his eyes. And that I've invited him to come and talk to me about it so that we can actually have a bit of a debrief, right? If there was something scary that he saw. If there was something that confused him about healthy sexual behavior or activity. Um, I think there are ways for us to offer respectful and appropriate information to our kids starting really young. I think fundamentally what we want to do as parents um, is to offer our kids uh, values, good values around sex and sexuality. Um, and I think that that can start very young. Um, it's, you know, fundamentally it's about how we treat ourselves and how we treat other people. And, um, and I think that those are lessons that we can offer very early. Um, and I don't have to tell, I don't have to decide for any of you. You all get to decide when you share particular pieces of information about sex and sexuality with your kids. But I will say this, if you think the topic is, as, is important, right? If you think it's anywhere near as important as I seem to be communicating with, and not that many people, I've never really heard anybody disagree with me and say, oh yeah, no, it's not that important. If you think it's important, then really my message is, what is your role in telling your child about this very important topic? And when, are you do when, when is that going to begin, right? And that's, that's for you to decide. Um, I have a belief that earlier is better. Um, I think when they're young, they're open to it. They're not squeamish. They don't go, ooh, that's disgusting. If it's always been something that's been on the table, if healthy sexuality has always been something that we can talk about, then our kids aren't going to go, ooh, gross. They're going to go, oh, yeah. R oh, right. Right. Sex is for fun. Yeah, yeah. Adults have sex all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I, I think that um, I think we can offer that to our kids. I think that it's available for us to, to set that frame up for them, um, and then to offer them information all along the way. I mean, it's a little bit like we don't, you know, you can say there's a pile here, and you can ask your two-year-old how many there are, and they might be able to go one, two, and free. They'll say free if they're three. One, two, and free. Um, but we don't, we don't start with calculus, right? We start with the easy stuff. Um, and we can do the same with, with sex and sexuality, right? Um, so kids really like um, simple, um, and to the point answers. So people say, well, what do, what do I say if my kid, if my four-year-old says, well, where do, where do babies come from? How are babies made? And I say, well, you can offer a very simple answer, which is that a, sp a sperm cell and an egg cell meet, and it starts the creation of a baby. A baby starts to grow. 
okay, but how does it get there? Now, sometimes a kid will ask that, right? It starts to grow in, in a woman's uterus. And, and, or you could say, well, a, a penis goes into a vagina to deliver a sperm cell to the egg cell, and then that sperm and egg fuse together, go down to the uterus, and a baby can start to grow there. That's a really simple answer. It's not that complicated. Um, and where kids want more information, they're going to say, well, wait a minute. A penis, like, what? how does that happen, right? And you can offer more information and more context as they're interested. Sometimes people um, will say to me, well, I'm happy to give my kids information, but I, I want to be child, a child-led. My, my children can decide. They can ask me questions. And when they ask me questions, I'll provide the answers. And as I explained to the faculty this afternoon, I don't think that's always the best approach um, for a couple reasons. Number one, some kids aren't askers. Some kids just don't ask a lot of questions. They listen carefully. They might be voracious readers. They know how to research. They know how to look. But they don't ask direct questions. My older kid isn't much of an asker. My younger kid's an asker. He, then he doesn't. He asks questions, and he wanders off. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm trying to tell you the answer. He's like, I don't care about the answer. But my older guy is like, you know, like, sorry, wait, you were going to answer that? I'm re you know, I'm, I'm ready. I'm down for that. So not everybody is an asker, and that doesn't mean they're not entitled to the information. It also doesn't mean they're not interested or curious about the information. The other thing is, is that I think um, our kids uh, learn from what we say and what we do, and they also learn from what we don't say and what we don't do. So we need to factor that in. If we don't have any conversations about sex and sexuality, we might inadvertently be messaging that this isn't a topic of conversation for our household. It's possible, right? I mean, it's a little bit like that's inappropriate. We don't know how that's being interpreted, how that's being understood. So I think it's not a bad idea to be explicit. How am I doing on time? Uh, Running out. Um, oh, um, you can say I don't know. So sometimes parents say to me, well, I don't want to get into this with my kids because I feel like I have too much to learn, right? Like, I, I know the basics, you know, I, I figured a bunch of stuff out, but I don't, there's a lot I don't know either. And my answer is, that's okay. This is a great place for you to let your kids know that you don't have all the answers. There's nothing wrong. In fact, I think it's a really healthy thing to say, you know, my mom and dad never talked to me about this stuff. And when I was in school, they never talked about this stuff either. I mean, your kids could be like, no kidding. But there's like, there's so much out there to know. Like, you knew nobody, right? You could say, and there's a lot of messages out there, a lot of lessons that are coming at us that are telling us that we should be uncomfortable having these conversations. And you know what? Sometimes I'm uncomfortable having these conversations. And I still think it's really important that you have good information. So I might be uncomfortable sometimes, but I'm really willing to have conversations with you about it. And sometimes we're going to have to do some learning together. So the good news is there are amazing books, some of which are in the hallway, um, about sex and sexuality. Uh, there's an author named Roby Harris. Um, two of her books are out there. She's got several more. Um, and they're fabulous. They're really rich with information. Um, and they're great books to read with kids. Um, and it's not like sit down and read the whole book cover to cover because they're big. They're chapters um, and they offer a lot of information and context about sex and sexuality. And they're wonderful. They're sex positive. They're healthy. They're informative. Um, and they're great. I was explaining to one parent that there's, um, it, there's, she's, she's got three books. One's for ages four and up. One's for seven and up. One's for ten and up. Um, and uh, loose, those are loose guides, right? Um, but all the way, the same illustrator, a guy named Michael Emberley, uh, did all the illustrations. And in all three of the books, there's a bird and a bee that are in the entire, they're woven through the entire book. And they're talking to each other about the content. And, um, and the bird is like really keen learner. Like, oh, this stuff is so cool. I love learning about this. And the, and the bee is like, oh, this is so embarrassing. And I'm so not, I don't want to learn this. And I don't want to know anything about this. 
And so one of the things that I think is really can be useful is to ask your kid if they feel like the bird or the bee on a particular section. Or do you sometimes feel like the bird and sometimes feel like the bee? Or did you used to feel like the bee and now you feel more like the bird? Right? Like there's all sorts of ways that we can engage with the material and use these fabulous little creatures, right, to help our kids um, express their own concerns or challenges with the content, right? You can say, like, you know, sometimes I really feel like the bee around this stuff. It's hard, I, you know, it's hard to have conversations about this, but I'm really interested in you knowing and I'm learning so much along with you. Those are great things for our kids to hear from us, I think. Um, we can also, if we don't have the book handy, you know, it's like, oh, you've asked a question, here's the book, let's read it. We are absolutely entitled and allowed to say to our kids, huh, great question. I have no idea how to answer that, right? You can say, I want to have a little time to think about that, and I'm going to come back to you with an answer because it's such a great question and an important one, right? Again, our kids learn from us that we're figuring out this parenting thing as they grow up, right? There's no harm in that. In fact, it messages all sorts of good things about us as human beings. Um, teachable moments happen all the time, um, far more often than I think we allow ourselves to see. Um, we create a lot of white noise around all the sexual imagery that chronically bombards us. Um, and I think when kids, um, especially when they start to read, it's a great idea to start addressing some of this stuff, right? Because they're, I mean, my seven-year-old right now is starting to read the signs on shop walls. And um, so I live in a really um, uh, heavily populated uh, part of Vancouver um, called Commercial Drive. It's hip. It's groovy. There's lots going on. And there's, a, a, like, a hair salon that has, like, other services in the back. And they have a sandwich sign outside that references anal bleaching <laughs> and, um, and full body waxing. And I, like, I saw it. And, like, literally, we're walking down the street, and there's a sign about that. And I, you know, I try and shuffle my <laughs> seven-year-old through because he's, like, hair tinting and right, eyelash extension, right? And I'm just like, OK, onwards, <laughs> onwards, good fellow. Uh, but you know, I, there's only so many times and I, I can push my kid. There's, they're, they're reading. They're paying attention. Billboards, signs about anal bleaching, all sorts of things right, are going to capture their attention. And here's the thing, I can pretend I didn't notice my kid reading, or I can say, I should offer some context to that piece of information because it's strange, right? Um, I don't know how to offer that context all the time, but I'm going to do my very best, right? Um, so uh, when our kids start to read especially, they are um, starting to integrate a whole lot of new information. Um, and every once in a while, we should notice what they're noticing and comment, right? And um, I was explaining to Vicky that, um, or I can't even remember who, I think you were there, but <laughs> walking down, walking with my street, my kid, my older kid, and we're in um, a, a shop and there was an, an ad um, for a, a, a band playing, you know, this Saturday night. And it said the name of the band and then there was a visual and the visual was a mostly naked woman. Right? And it was sort of breast forward. It was very sexually suggestive. And there's my eight year old, and he's just kind of like looking at it. And, you know, not a lot going on on his face, but he's like, he's not looking at any of the other posters. He is looking at that one. And, and it, again, I could just be like, okay, I don't really want to know what you're thinking. Or I can say, it's a strange poster, isn't it? I have no idea what that woman almost naked has to do with that band that's playing on Saturday night, right? And then I said, but you should know that all sorts of people and companies uh, use sex to sell stuff. I don't know why they do it. Maybe it works. I don't see the connection. I think it's strange. I don't always like it. But it's happening. It happens all around us. So I want you to know that. 
right? I want you to know that that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't know what they're trying to sell there. And he was like, oh, okay, right? And that was it. Like, just give you a little, let me give you a little analysis there and then move on, right? So we can do that all the time. Um, bathtubs with young kids are really great. Great time to name genitals, to talk about privacy, private activity, private space right? Um, uh, seeing a pregnant woman, seeing a breastfeeding woman offers fabulous opportunities for us to talk to our kids. Um, I, I think our kids hit a certain age and uh, talking about the news is really important, right? Um, they're getting a lot of messages from popular culture. So kids who are 12 and 13 start to kind of spend some time all about like the pop culture stars, right? They know a lot about these people. <laughs> um, and of course, it's so constructed uh, and carefully crafted what we know about these people, but there's a lot that we know about these people. Um, and the newspaper offers us uh, a chance to have a very different perspective about uh, life and the world around us, right? So we can offer that. I mean, Roe versus Wade, the 40th anniversary happened a handful of months ago, right? The abortion, legalizing abortion case in the US. It's not the case that's applicable in Canada. But Ro, it was the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, and I was reading about it, and my son was like, what's, what's Roe v. Wade? And I, and I was, okay, let me tell you what, what this day marks and why it's important to me, right? So again, this is a chance for not only me to share a piece of history and news, but I can give my perspective on a topic and also explain the controversy around the topic, why it's such a big news story and why it's so different than what the circumstances were 60 or 80 years ago, right? So it gives me a chance to share my values with my kids. Um, I, I like this one because this is like teachable moment, right? We have pets. They lick themselves, right? Dogs hump other dogs or your child's leg, right? We can talk about that. That's an opportunity to talk to our kids. Um, um, overwhelmingly, high school kids especially are super interested in information about relationships, how to navigate them. You know, there's a lot of reality TV out there that has nothing to do with reality. It's offering uh, really uh, kind of misguided messages to our kids. Um, teenagers are extraordinarily interested in um, gathering information about how to be in healthy relationships. Um, we think they've kind of got that dialed, or we think they're going to figure it out at some later time, but they are hungry for it. Overwhelmingly in high school, sex education um, is typically about sexually, transmission, uh, sexually transmitted infection prevention or pregnancy prevention, both of which are extraordinarily important for young people. Overwhelmingly, what they want to know is how to ask somebody out on a date how to treat somebody who they're becoming sexually intimate with, right? How to navigate and negotiate that relationship. They are super hungry for it. Um, and that's, there's a lot of information that we can bring up in really easy ways that help frame up healthy relationships. I was saying to one of the faculty today when she said, you know, I'm with 12 year olds and they're starting to talk about crushes and pop culture people and stuff they're paying attention to. I said, well, that's, there's a great opportunity there to, it, there's a teachable moment to talk about crushes and what they are, but then to also talk about, well, what does a healthy relationship look like? Like when you have a crush on somebody, when you like somebody, what is it that draws you to that person? Can you name it? What are the characteristics of somebody that makes them worthy of your crush? You know, and it's a way of reflecting back some healthy behaviors, some things about being treated well, right? Self-respect, confidence, um, smarts, right? Um, we can hear all sorts of things. Um, we can challenge people when they just talk about how beautiful somebody is or how they have a perfect body, right? Um, and ideas that are kind of given to us by, by popular culture. We can really push back and offer a really broader and more extensive view on what it is to, uh, to be intimate with somebody, what good partnerships look like, what uh, bad partnerships, what bad relationships look like. Um, they need to hear that because the, the, some of the messages they're given are quite skewed. So um, I think I'm out of time now.
So I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to a whole lot of the material. The, this, this one is really great. Um, I see now that uh, what was printed was my 6 to 8 and older. Um, I have another one, and if people need it, you can feel free to email me, or I'll send it to Vicki, and she can uh, distribute it. But I do have one that has earlier uh, um, guideposts. I think um, the only thing I want to say about this is that it, guidepost is a guide. It's not definitive. Um, I think these are um, typical stages uh, and information that kids can know at certain ages. But I don't know your kids. You know your kids. Um, and I just would ask for you to pay attention to the, what I said earlier about how kids will typically identify themselves as being ready for information two to four years earlier than what parents deem them to be ready for. Um, oh, I'll say one more thing, and then I'll literally stop for questions. Um, a friend of mine who's got a 10-year-old daughter um, has started watching Glee with her 10-year-old. And I think this is brilliant. Now, maybe 12 is better for your kid or whatever, but watching Glee with a prepubescent or just pubescent kid I think is amazing. And what she did was set it up so that there's, um, there's a couple rules. One is that they only watch it together, never by themselves or with other people. And two is that at any point in watching an episode, either one of them can hit pause whenever they want so that they can have a conversation or ask a question. And Glee is filled with all sorts of good things about adolescence and development and acceptance and all sorts of not so great things that are equally wonderful to do that pause and have a conversation about certain behaviors, right? Um, and they're singing and dancing. So, <laughs> you know, like you can all sing together. The songs are, you know, they're on the radio so much that everybody kind of knows them. So I think that's a really interesting idea and opportunity. Um, it's a little bit like getting those books, the Ruby Harris books, and reading them with your kid. And then when they're finished with that, there's like, so what's the next way that you and I can sit side by side and discuss some of these issues that are real and I think, like, Glee is fabulous. I mean, I haven't seen all the seasons, so I don't know for sure. But I've seen a couple of them. And I think they offer incredible lessons. So I'm sticking that in. My kid's 10. I don't think he's quite ready for Glee. Um, uh, but a year from now, or two years year from now, probably, he and I are going to start watching that. We'll get rid of his little brother. And we'll have a weekly date for, uh, for Glee. And, and he'll dance and sing along with him.